How about posts and cores? Well, sadly, there is no right answer to the question of post and core design. There are too many clinical variables that have to be addressed. So what I want to try to do for you today is give you a set of decision points so you can try to determine what will give you the most predictable outcome. We know that the effect of the design of the, of the core of the post will have a direct effect on retention. Okay. Parallel sided posts with serrations are more retentive than smooth sided parallel posts. And what's important to understand is that parallel posts, if they fit well within the canal, are least likely to cause fracture. We know that dowel length is more important for retention than, di than the diameter of the dowel. And of course, we know that the ferrule is probably the most critical component of success. Now, there have been a number of studies that have replicated this, and I just picked tan because I happen to like it. And what tan did is took 50 extracted central incisors and randomly assigned them to five groups and then off-axis loaded them until failure occurred. And this is the type of failure that you would see, just the fracture of the tooth. So these are the five groups that he created. The first, he prepared a crown, the tooth for a crown, and placed a crown on it. The second group, he prepared the tooth for a crown, created an endo axis, did an endo, and placed a crown. The third group, was an endodontically treated tooth with a cast and post and core with a two millimeter uniform ferrule around the tooth. The fourth group was a cast post and core with a two millimeter ferrule on the buccal and lingual, but a half millimeter ferrule on the mesial and distal. And the final group he created was a cast post and core with no ferrule. And the results are not surprising. The cast post and core with no ferrule off-axis load failed first, followed by the uneven ferrule. But take a look at the two millimeter ferrule. It did equally as well as the crown preparation with no endo and the crown preparation with an endo axis. So the two millimeter ferrule, uniform ferrule, is the gold standard. How about choice of materials? Because you know many of us have heard, well, you know, only metal posts crack teeth. Fiber posts don't. Well, Rip showed that's not true, that you could get fractures of the tooth using any material. In fact, what we have to recognize is that after endodontic treatment, there is progressive de degradation of the demineralized collagen matrices. We know that aging dentin becomes sclerotic and becomes much more brittle. So this is going to result in increased risk of cracks and propagation, and we have to be aware of that. So older you know, teeth endodontically treated may not be good abutments, and this is something to consider. So one of the things that people like to look at, and this is something I would consider, is the modulus of elasticity, that the modulus of elasticity of our posts should be as close to dentin as possible. And this is why fiber posts are so popular. Titanium is the next best selection based on Stewartson's study. And interestingly enough, gold and titanium are very similar in a modulus of elasticity to tooth structure. Bergman, looking at a six-year retrospective study, supported, reported a success rate of 90% using cast posts and cores. And what he noted is that you know, type 3 or type 4 gold alloy its modulus elasticity and coefficient of thermal expansion is similar to that of the tooth and yet it also has good compressive strength, which makes it a good choice of material for a cast post and core. And for those of you who don't do a lot of these, they're very straightforward to do. Here's just a pictorial lineage of how I do it. You know, we use some sort of carrying mechanism for the post, GC pattern resin to, create, to adapt to the post space, create the core, prep the core, remove it, invest it, cast it, and cement it. Well, what about bonded fiber posts? Now, Suarez did a very good literature review using looking at retrospective and prospective clinical studies, looking at cast posts and cores and fiber posts. And he looked at the rate of survival and the most prevalent types of failures. And he noted that glass posts demonstrated good survival in clinical studies with similar performance to cast posts and cores. 
metallic posts have good clinical survival, but he found that the associated failures were mostly irreversible, unlike what happens to the fiber posts, meaning the tooth fractured. Well, what's interesting, you know, in my observation clinically, fiber posts fail differently. When they fail, what we find, or what I find, is that decay has worked its way down the canal space, resulting in destruction of the tooth, and the tooth, while not broken, is not restorable either because there's not enough tooth left to work with. Well, it's interesting because I kept searching in the literature and I found this study by Ma. And now Ma looked at the load fatigue of teeth with different ferrule lengths, but decided to look at to study restorations with using fiber posts, composite cores, bonded in all ceramic crowns. Because what Ma noted that the 1.5 millimeter ferrule has been suggested from studies using metal crowns with cast posts and cores looted with zinc oxyphosphate. So Ma designed his study a little bit differently and defined failure a little differently. So not only did Ma look at different ferrules, zero millimeter ferrule, half millimeter ferrule, and one millimeter ferrule, utilizing again fiber posts and bonding them. And again, off axis load until failure. But this is what Ma did that was different. Ma placed a strain gauge over the lingual margin to register micro movement of the crown margin after cyclic loading. And he defines failure as when that margin opened. Now, now think about this for a moment. How many times have you had a patient come in and complain, I have a funny taste of my front tooth? And you check it, uh, you, the explorer doesn't detect anything, you pull on it, there's no bubbling or pumping, you take an x-ray, everything looks good, and you say, I'm sorry, it, everything looks good. The patient leaves, and they come back later it's complaining of the same thing, and you still don't find anything. And then one day they come in and the cast post and core and the restorations in their hands. Well, what happened? What happened is they were complaining about micro leakage. They were tasting it, but yet it hadn't failed yet. But the failure did start occurring at the point of micro leakage. And what Ma found is with zero millimeter ferro, it only took 213 cycles before the margin opened. Now with one millimeter ferro, it was over 260,000 cycles before the restoration failed. In fact, they just stopped the study at that point. But here's the problem with literature, and this is why you have to read entire articles rather than just relying on what the, uh, the abstract tells you. If you look at the half millimeter ferro bonded, you're going to go, wow, 155,000 cycles, that's pretty good. But inside the article, Ma says there was a huge standard deviation, and so they could not recommend a half millimeter ferro. A great systematic review of endodontically treated single-rooted teeth with cast posts or direct posts was done by Hidenki. Okay? They looked at a number of references in the database and came up with 1,773 references. And out of those 1,773 articles, they found 10 articles that met inclusion that were in vitro studies. But this is really cool. They found six articles that met inclusion that were in vivo studies. And this is what they found. Okay? Based on these 10 in vitro and 6 in vivo studies, there was no conclusive evidence that favored a cast over direct post and core restoration, or vice versa. So both work 